Hello and uh, welcome to Bowties and Bottles. I'm your host Thaddeus Miller. Uh, I spent my entire life as a sommelier and beverage professional and I thought I'd maybe give everyone a peek behind the curtain and maybe some information on how to better enjoy wine and spirits both in their own homes celebrating with their friends and when out and about at uh, some of the great restaurants that hopefully will be opening up soon after uh, our quarantine period. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is are just a couple basic adjectives in the world of wine that sometimes may be confusing to the uninitiated. So let's talk. take a moment to talk about alcohol, right? You know what? You love it. It's your friend. It's a good time. Please drink responsibly. We got in all kinds of trouble last night. But alcohol in terms of how you experience um, certainly wine and also cocktails um, is that you feel it. Um, and I mean the feeling of warmth. As soon as I have a, a drink, my ears get red. I feel warm here. I feel warmth in my cheeks my throat and then eventually in your chest and all through the center of your, of your body. Um, it, it works really, really well in terms of enhancing our experience and that alcohol will cut through fat content. That's why we like things like Cabernet Sauvignon, um, which tends to be a little higher in alcohol, especially from warmer climates like in California. That's a great steakhouse wine, right? Alcohol is going to cut through the fattiness of, let's say, a, a ribeye or even a New York strip for that matter with the fat cap on it. Um, alcohol is not a bad thing, but I think you need to be aware of it. Sometimes we go from drinking lighter, less alcoholic things. This, uh, certainly in the summertime, moving into the fall, we've stuck with really light, vibrant, either sparkling wine or things like Pinot Grigio and Sauvignon Blanc. And some of you may know, um, things like Aligoti or, uh, Albarino, fresh zippy things that are delightful, but lower in alcohol. As we move into the colder weather, we tend to like bigger, heartier, richer wines, and that's wonderful. But realize that you can go from an 11.5 or 12% white wine during the warmer weather to a 14 or even 15.5% alcohol red with every glass safety first. Next, let's talk about the uh, often spoken about, most often misunderstood legs in wine. Uh, I make the same half joke all the time. Um, and I always say like in the world of wine, I'm not sure what legs are. I know absolutely what great legs look like on a brunette, but I don't know what they look like um, on, a, on a wine. Uh, legs are gonna tell you viscosity. Um, some of the things that are gonna stick to a glass are gonna be the aforementioned alcohol. Higher alcohol content will stick to a glass, um, as will higher sugar. And nine times out of 10, alcohol and sugar are opposites. Uh, fermentation 101, right? You, you have grape juice that's got sugar in it, you add yeast, yeast eats the sugar and gives you two things. It gives you uh, alcohol, bueno, and CO2, bubbles, which is how you make champagne, right? You just put a cork in it and all those bubbles stay in the wine. So those are the two main things that will stick to glass. Uh, glycerol or glycerin will also stick to glass, but we don't need to worry about that yet. Um, when people look at great legs, so higher alcohol or higher sugar things will have that will take a lot longer for the, the, the legs to form and they'll run very slowly. Whereas things that are kind of lower or more moderate in terms of alcohol and sugar will either have very quick forming, quick running legs or just sheeting. So when you're looking at legs, that's gonna tell you viscosity. So if you've got a big red wine in your hand and you happen to like bigger, richer, fuller, opulent things and you see slow, fat legs, those are the nice legs you're looking for. If you happen to like Sauvignon Blanc and things like Chablis or un -Oak Chardonnays, things that tend to be zippy and more mineral driven and more lively, you're probably gonna want or prefer faster forming, faster running legs. Next, let's talk about acidity. Um, acidity is about the pH of, of whatever the liquid is, right? So lower numbers give you higher acidity and higher numbers give you higher alkalinity. Um, we like acid a lot and people don't always understand why. Acid livens things up. It wakes things up, it shakes them up, it gives animation and life to whatever's in your glass. Um, I like to talk about uh, getting a big, beautiful piece of salmon, right? You get this great piece of salmon, what's the first thing that you do? You put lemon juice on it, right? That acidity cuts through the richness, kind of wakes it up. You're in your own home, you've got dinner ready, and you're like, oh, we don't have any salad dressing. So what do you do? You make a very quick vinaigrette, right? Extra virgin olive oil for fat, balsamic vinegar for acid. Acid cuts through the richness. It hits more parts of your tongue. It's a more enjoyable experience. 
And one of the big things that drives acidity is a cooler growing environment. So if you want to make it easier on yourself, go to things, go to places that are a little cooler, you'll find more acidity naturally. We're going to talk about body and weight and texture. So when we talk about body and palate weight, sometimes people can get confused by that. I've always used the example of dairy. Um, I use the example of milk, right? So if you've had skim milk, that's a little thinner, almost watery. 2% milk would be like a medium bodied wine. And then when you get to full bodied things, you're talking about um, whole milk, right? Um, and then if you were to go so far as to do like ports and cherries, Madeiras and super fortified rich wines, it's almost like the weight of heavy whipping cream. Uh, on your tongue. Also, since we're talking about body weight, we should talk a little bit more about texture and how things feel in the mouth. Um, personally, I've never been a, a fan of the adjective smooth because there are a lot of things that are smooth and what I've found in talking to people is that it tends to be when they say smooth, it just means not offensive to their palate. Not saying that the wine isn't smooth, it just means it's something that they don't find in any way aggressive or off-putting in a wine. Um, I tend to go for a little bit more specificity. Um, I want to know if it's silky, if it's velvety, if it's creamy, if you're like, it's like the texture of like gelato. The next thing we should talk about is tannin. Tannin. You mad dog tannin. One of the most maligned and misunderstood things in the world of wine. Uh, tannin exists in everything that is vegetal out there. Um, I'm sure pretty much everybody at some point in life has had uh, a glass of either iced tea or hot tea or had hot coffee and we all know that sensation of the drying aspect that grippiness on your on your on your palate that kind of pulls all the moisture out of your out of your tongue that is tannin so the thing is that tannin isn't a flavor profile we're just talking about texture and mouthfeel um, so tannin is really it's kind of an alert a mini allergic reaction with your palate right it sucks all the moisture out of your tongue gives you that grippiness and then if you were to, if that wine, like, let's take, for example, Cabernet Sauvignon, right? It's got a fair amount of acidity. It's got higher alcohol content, thick skin grape, lots of tannin, especially if it's been aged in an in a, in a oak barrel. Wood has tannin. That's why when you go to the doctor and they use that tongue depressor, it takes all the moisture out of your tongue, right? It's tannin. It's a really great counterpoint to fat. We talked about acid cutting through fat. Tannin kind of grabs onto and loves it. It hits more of your mouth and more of your palate, making it an overall more interesting experience, right? If you were listening to a concert that was one note, it would probably not be a great concert. But as we start to add in chords um, and, and layers of sound, it becomes more interesting and flavor works the same way. Lastly, I would like to talk about what can be daunting, old world and new world. Not only what those terms mean, but how it, those wines tend to present. Now I am painting with an extraordinarily wide brush here. This is a rule of thumb. This is a basic entry level guide. As you go through the world of, of drinking, you'll find that you can always find exceptions to every rule. Um, but to get us started, old world, new world, and broad brush strokes. So old world, and I'm talking about, when we're talking about old world in the world of wine, predominantly we're talking about Europe, right? Italy, France, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Austria, those sorts of places, right? Um, now we're seeing great wines out of Hungary and Slovakia as well, but that's the old world. When we're talking about the new world, we're definitely talking about all of the Americas and New Zealand, um, Australia, and also it sounds a little counterintuitive because it's on the continent of Africa, definitely South African wines are new world um, because they haven't, the rest of the world hasn't seen their wines in a long time and they present in the same style. So. New World wines, California, Washington, Australia, New Zealand, those wines tend to show with fruit first and then earth and spice and kind of everything else. Whereas in the Old World, Italy, France, Portugal, Spain, you tend to see those wines, both aroma and palate wise, show with earth and spicy notes first and then fruit. And then the big difference is what condition the fruit is in. So in the New World, we tend to find that fruits are either like very fresh, fruits or candied or jammy notes, right? Very bright, very high in sugar, which is why even when there's not sugar in some of the New World wines, because those fruit flavors are so bright, there can be a perception of fruit or a perception of sugar. Uh, in the old world, fruits tend to express themselves 
in a more either dried or stewed style. So not to say that you can't find new world wines that express as old world or vice versa, but this is a great tool when you go to your wine shop um, and find someone that you trust or you go to your favorite restaurant as a jumping off point for what your palate is attracted to at this point in life. So those are just a handful of adjectives in the world of wine. Um, we'll continue to do more uh, videos like this. If there's something specifically you'd like to ask, if there's a specific adjective or wine or winery or region, or even cocktails for that matter, um, whether spirit or origin, please let us know in the comments below. Uh, thank you again. I hope that you like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.